Yeah, he's that's all set up. Okay, why don't you begin? Well, that was super disciplined. Do I need a microphone? It's Set up a fair. We're going to use the backup. Okay. It's not going to be what I wanted, but this. You want me to, you want me to wear? No, no, it's, it's in the laptop. Okay. So, I'll tell you where to stand. Okay. You can move around. It picks up. Okay, very good. Okay. Howdy, everyone. Uh, today, I will introduce the speaker, Dr. Dashwood. Uh, he did his undergrad in the University of Pulling with biological sciences, a master in the University of Surrey with toxicology, uh, the PhD in the University of Portsmouth with genetic toxicology, and all the places are located in the United Kingdom. Now he's the director of Center for Epigenetics and Disease Prevention, uh, Texas A.M. Health Science Center, Health Science Center, and Institute. Institute of Bioscience and Technology in Houston, and uh, John S. John Endold for disease prevention, and uh, he is also a professor in Department of Nutrition and Food Science, the adjunct professor of Department of Clinical Cancer Prevention, and an MD in Anderson Can Cancer Center. Uh, Dr. Dashwood has been interested in the anti-cancer mechanisms of dietary agents natural products and their metabolites for over 25 years. His current research is focused on genetic and the MP genetic mechanisms in cancer prevention. The Dashwood Laboratory has taken a lead in seeking new dietary HDAC inhibitors, clarifying the associated molecular mechanisms and the performing translation studies in human volunteers. Uh, the research activities have broadened the magnetic magnetically to include the histone and the non-histone protein acet acetylation changes in DNA methylation status and alterations in non-coding RNAs. So let's welcome today's speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Two weeks ago I was sitting in the audience and uh, I got to hear the wonderful seminar by Dr. David Threadgill who you will recall was talking about the genetic basis of colorectal cancer. He was talking about his interesting mouse strains, the collaborative cross. Hopefully all of you remember that seminar. It was only two, day, uh, two weeks ago and it's online. So this saves me doing a lot of the introductory slides, which is fantastic. So uh, you've already had time to read the introduction. Does anyone know what that refers to, that George W. Bush, W. H. Bush, no more broccoli? The older people are nodding their heads and the other ones are going. So the first President Bush announced during his presidency uh, that he'd been fed broccoli throughout his life by his mother and he hated it. And as president of the USA, he was never going to eat it ever again. <laughs> of course, the inevitable consequence that led to a huge upsurge in people wanting to eat more broccoli and subsequent presidents announcing that they love the stuff. Most recently, uh, Broccoli or Brock Obama is one of his nicknames. <laughs> so I'm just gonna go back to one slide that Dr. Threadgill presented. And again, it makes, this is from the World Health Organization and it summarizes uh, cancer rates, colorectal cancer rates around the world. And it emphasizes the point that these differ according to country, according to location. And in 2012, you can see some countries have very high rates of colorectal cancer. Others have very low rates. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out, I spent a lot of time in Japan. It's one of my favorite countries to visit. I spent a lot of time doing research over there at the National Cancer Center. When I first started visiting 25 years ago, Japan, instead of being red on the map, would have been the lowest color. So this means just in my life, lifetime, I've seen colorectal cancer go from one of the, 
the lower incidences of cancer in Japan to one of the higher ones. And if you look on the right hand side, you can see the blue line there for Japan. So just over, you know, from the 1980s to 2000s, this has gone up twofold. Uh, and other countries are following suit, including China uh, and Thailand and other countries. Whereas on the other hand, some other countries like the US, you'll see those trends have actually gone in the reverse direction over the same time frame. So in the case of the US, there are a number of things we can point to. One, of course, is screening colonoscopies. People 50 and older are recommended to go for screening colonoscopy exams, and it's a non-painful operation, and if you find a polyp or a tumor, it's very easy to remove. Um, and of course, the other important player here is the role of diet and lifestyle. So one of the key messages I want to make here is, you know, you are certainly having a certain genetic component, but a lot of this, which is what Dr. Threadgill talked about, a lot of this points to reversibility or modification by diet and lifestyle, for good or for bad. So again, Dr. Threadgill presented that a couple of weeks ago, but I'd like to ask you to think about this question. Do you think those changes over a 20-year period of time are synonymous with sort of incremental acquisition of traits, the way Mendel described it? Or do you think they're synonymous with Lamarck views, that you have certain external impacts that lead to huge changes in phenotype? In other words, disease risk. I'm not going to answer that question. I'll let you answer it, hopefully, as we go through this seminar. So this is one of my favorite cover articles from Time magazine. It's a picture of DNA being unzipped. And next to it, it says, the new science of epigenetics reveals how the choices you make can change your genes and those of your kids. So we can, again, we can debate whether this is really new science. Some would say it certainly goes back to the discussions of nature versus nurture and Darwin and Lamarck. And this is a very interesting magazine, a Time, Time magazine article. I, I encourage you to read this. It's free to download online. And it gives a nice definition. Epi epigenetics refers to heritable changes in gene expression caused by mechanisms other than changes in the DNA sequence. So this is something of a paradigm shift. For, for many years, people have thought about cancer as driven by changes in our DNA sequence, mutations and chromosome rearrangements. And certainly those are important drivers of cancer development. But now we know that layered on top of the DNA, that's what literally what epigenetics means, is on top of the genetics, is a whole other layer that has nothing to do with the DNA sequence. It has to do with how DNA is packaged, how DNA becomes accessible or not accessible, and whether genes in those regions can be expressed or not. So the, the, the main take home message that I wanna have from my lecture today is you are what you eat, and this is because of your modifiable epigenome. The non-modifiable part is, is the DNA sequence. If you've got a tumor developing and it's got a mutation in a driver like an oncogene or a tumor suppressor gene, that's more or less irreversible. But that doesn't mean that you can't do something to act on that cell or act on that tumor to reverse or stop the progression. And so my lab and many other labs have been interested in dietary factors in foods that impact on this reversible epigenome. Things like lipoic acid in spinach, sulfur compounds in garlic and other allium vegetables. Rye bran, of course, is a good source of dietary fiber. And as we heard in our previous seminar, when we eat dietary fiber, it goes through the gut and the bacteria ferment that fiber to produce short chain fatty acids. And those can act to affect your epigenome. And then the one I'm gonna focus on for my talk today, again, not President Bush's favorite story, but it's the, the broccoli. And what is it in broccoli that might impact on the epigenome? I'm going to be talking about histone modifications. And these are reversible post-translational modifications. So they can be put on and taken off depending on different circumstances. So how does that work specifically? How exactly might we envisage 
things in food affecting these various chemical groups on our histones. So just to back up quickly, I'm sure everyone knows this, but if you think about a chromosome and you start to zoom in on this, you start to see the DNA wrapped around the nucleosome. So this is the chromatin structure. It's kind of like the beads on a string analogy. All right, and this is a way of packaging the DNA into our nucleus. As you zoom in on this a little closer, there are various things going on here. So this red dot actually signifies DNA methylation. I'm not going to be talking about DNA methylation today in my seminar. It's certainly one of the key epigenetic regulators of gene expression. And I'd be happy to talk about this at the end if there are any questions. But the other key point is, as I just alluded to, are these histone tails. So these are tails that protrude out from the nucleosome, and these can carry, again, these different chemical groups. They can carry methyl groups, acetyl groups, phosphate groups, ubiquitin groups, biotin groups, and many other groups. And again, these can be put on and taken off according to circumstances. So what exactly is the, the model for how this is affecting gene expression? So this is what we would think of as a sort of an open chromatin situation. The DNA is accessible, genes can be turned on and expressed. So in this situation, in a sort of a simplistic way, we have the active open chromatin, and here you're seeing the, the tails of the histones are acetylated. Now, the reverse scenario is when you have this sort of con condensed chromatin. And this occurs when the histone are deacetylated. This open up groups on the DNA that now interact with the proteins and the histones. So this sort of leads to a very condensed, constricted chromatin situation. And because of this, it's very difficult for transcription factors to gain access to the DNA. And this is the situation one often finds in cancer cells. So in order to shut down things, for example, like tumor suppressor gene, if you express a tumor suppressor gene in a cancer cell, you often trigger that cell to die. So for a cancer cell to survive and proliferate, to progress and go forward as a tumor, it has to shut down those tumor suppressors. And so this is one of the main mechanisms that occur in cancer cells. So someone had a very interesting idea. Well, we know the enzyme that's doing this. Cancer cells overexpress enzymes called HDAX or histone deacetylase. So as that name signifies, this enzyme can deacetylate or remove acetyl groups from histones. So it takes all these acetyl groups and removes them and leads to this condensed chromatin. How about if we reverse that process? Let's treat now with an HDAC inhibitor. What this should do is drive the equilibrium back in the reverse direction. So in other words, this would allow other enzymes to be recruited called HATs, histone acetyl transferases. As the name implies, these enzymes put the acetyl groups back on and open up the chromatin. Right, so the idea here is just reading in sequence, HDAC inhibition leads to increased histone acetylation, opening of the chromatin, and now the DNA becomes accessible. So now you have the transcription factors and their co-activators finding all of those genes, those tumor suppressor genes that were shut down. They all get re-expressed, and now they trigger apoptosis or other effects in the cancer cells. So why is this of importance? Well, we know that HDAC inhibitors are getting a lot of interest in clinical trials currently, in human trials in different cancers. We know that the balance of histone acetylation and deacetylation is disturbed in many, in fact, I would say it's disturbed in all cancer cells. And we know that HDAC inhibitors can turn on silenced tumor suppressors, things like P21 and Fax, that are regulating the cell cycle and cell death. And we also know that these HDAC inhibitors in a cell culture dish can cause cancer cells to stop their growth and to trigger apoptosis, programmed cell death. So in a Petri dish, 
HDAC inhibitors cause cancer cells to stop growing and to die. That's great news. Even better news is if you now put them in animals, they stop tumors from growing in animals. And a number of them have now moved into human clinical trials. So here's the poster child for the HDAC inhibitors. It's called Saha. The drug name is Varinostat. And this is showing promise in patients with advanced cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, so blood cancers, leukemias, and lymphomas. So how does it work? You'll notice it has certain chemical features. It has a cap group. It has a five or six carbon spacer and a functional group. And this is very important because it allows the molecule to fit precisely into the pocket of the HDAC enzyme and inhibit the enzyme. So there's some very elegant X-ray crystallography studies that were reported over 10 years ago now. They took known HDAC inhibitors, they mixed them with different HDACs, and then they crystallized them. And from that, we know a great deal about the shape of the pocket, how the enzymes work to deacetylate histones, and how these drugs are able to fit in the pocket. And one of the most important features is at the bottom of that pocket is a zinc. That zinc is absolutely required for catalysis. So these molecules are able to interact, form a bidentate ligand with that zinc, and these act as very potent HDAC inhibitors. So in clinical trials, when you treat people who have a lymphoma, these enter the lymphoma cells, they inhibit the HDACs, shut down the HDAC activity, histones become acetylated, genes are turned back on again, and now the cancer cells are triggered to undergo apoptosis or shrinkage. Our interest about 10 years ago comes from the fact that some compounds in the diet resemble the actions of HDAC inhibitors. Now I make it clear here, I'm not talking about super potent nanomolar KI drug-like inhibition. Thankfully the compounds in our food aren't that potent. But nonetheless, at the levels that we're normally exposed to during food consumption, they are clearly modifying our HDAC activity in various ways. So the compound we chose to begin with actually was a compound called sulforaphane. And this comes from broccoli and broccoli sprouts. So this is what the broccoli sprouts look like. Some of you are used to bean sprouts, uh, but this is a different type of sprout. It's a very early three-day-old version of what would become mature broccoli. And this was actually worked out in my lab at the time by a PhD student, Mindy Mizak. So a lot of the early data I'm going to show you now was done by Mindy. After she got her PhD, she went to medical school and got her MD. And she's now uh, a practicing oncologist at Johns Hopkins. And I don't know if this was a case of uh, serendipity or what, but Hopkins was actually where the sulforaphane was first discovered. So she's actually gone to work at the university that started off the research that got her really excited about broccoli and the compounds in broccoli. So the person who actually discovered sulforaphane was Professor Paul Talalay. So you've heard of Superman and Batman. If you go into Google and type Sprout Man, you'll pull up a picture of Professor Talalay. And he's one of the great pioneers in the field of cancer chemo prevention. People like Michael Spawn and Lee Wattenberg, but Talalay is one of the top chemo prevention guys, like the first generation. I consider myself second or third generation. So Dr. Talalay had a very simple screening assay in his lab at the time. It was a colorimetric assay. I won't bore you with all the details, but was really an assay to detect phase two enzyme inducer activity. So if you don't know what that means, when we take in foreign compounds into our body, there are two broad classes of enzymes, phase one and phase two. Phase one puts an oxygen on the molecule. Phase two adds very large polar groups to make the molecule water soluble and excretable. So the phase two enzymes are thought of as quote unquote detoxification pathways. So he thought, wouldn't it be neat if we had a simple screening assay for phase two enzyme inducer activity 
So he developed this simple 9612 format. And if you see color in there, something is inducing phase two enzymes. So it's sort of a readout of good detoxification activity. So what he did was to screen just about every fruit and vegetable you can imagine to see which compound, which foods have the highest inducer activity and potentially the most chemopreventive activity. And out of all that screening, this is just a small part of this, he identified cruciferous vegetables as having the greatest inducer activity. Things like cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, bok choy, you know, things like that, kale. And out of those, broccoli had by far the greatest activity. So then he went on and looked at other types of broccoli, different cultivars, frozen, fresh, and there was an enormous variability in inducer activity. So if you go to your freezer and pull out your frozen broccoli there that's been sitting there who knows how many months or years, that definitely has some phase two inducer activity. This would still be a high relative to some of the other things like tomatoes and so on. But you'll notice fresh broccoli generally has greater inducer activity than frozen. But look over here, three-day-old broccoli sprouts. You compare them with what's frozen. They have 50 to 200 times the inducer activity of the frozen broccoli. So actually, Johns Hopkins has sort of put, patented this particular cultivar of broccoli sprouts and all around the country you can, I haven't seen it in many Texas supermarkets, but in places like Oregon on the East Coast, you can get these broccoli sprouts in the supermarket. So that, so that was really exciting. The question is how on earth is it doing this? How exactly are the compounds in broccoli doing this? So one of the interesting things is when he fractionated the broccoli and the broccoli sprouts, multiple fractionations over and over again, he eventually ended up with one molecule that turned out to be the main guy doing this. And this was the molecule sulforaphane that I just mentioned. So how exactly is sulforaphane doing this? I'm going to summarize now on one figure, more than 10 years of research. So this is a very, very important pathway that exists in our cells and is responsible for sort of detecting foreign compounds and leading to detoxification. If you don't have this pathway in your cells, you'd be in big trouble. So this is called the NRF2 signaling pathway. And you can see that in the cytoplasm, NRF2 is normally interacting with a protein partner called KEEP1. What happens is when sulforaphane enters the cell, it causes these two proteins to separate from one another. NRF2 enters the nucleus and it interacts with partners like ZIP to then recognize particular sequences on DNA. The ARE there stands for antioxidant response element. It's a particular sequence of bases in DNA. And if that exists on the promoter of a gene, then these two guys sit down on that gene and they activate it. So that gene becomes turned on. So it includes things like NQ01, glutathione S transferase. I'll come back to this in just a minute. And antioxidant enzymes such as heme oxygenase 1. Actually, there are dozens and dozens of these genes that become activated through this pathway. So in general, when we eat broccoli and sulforaphane triggers NRF2 to enter the nucleus, it drives gene expression to detoxify the carcinogen. So this has been the thinking about how sulforaphane is working for more than 10 years. But we came up with an alternative not mutually exclusive, but, but alternative hypothesis for how sulforaphane might be working. So again, this was done by Mindy Mizak and Dr. Andy Karplas. It's a very good biochemist in, at Oregon State University. And based on our collaborations, we realized that in the food that we eat, in the broccoli, in the cruciferous vegetables, there is a molecule called glucoraphanin. So this is sort of the precursor of sulforaphane. It's the storage form. And when you eat broccoli, when you munch down on a piece of broccoli 
and you break open the, the, the cells of the broccoli plant, it releases an enzyme called myrosinase, which cleaves sulforaphane off of glucoraphanine. And when sulforaphane enters the liver, it's metabolized through this pathway. So if you eat broccoli for lunch, by afternoon tea, by 4 p.m., appreciable levels of this, these metabolites are appearing in the urine. So sulforaphane cis and sulforaphane net are appearing in the urine. So we simply took each of these molecules and other metabolites and we did computational modeling. We took the known crystal structures of HDAX with bound inhibitors and then we asked in a computer do these intermediates interact with the HDAC pocket in a similar way? And the answer was yes, or at least for one of them. And the best one happened to be this one, sulforaphane cis. So computational modeling said the sulforaphane cis should be a very good fit for the HDAC pocket and should be an HDAC inhibitor. So then we actually tested that. We bought a kit. You can buy an HDAC activity kit. It's an in vitro assay. And we tested different increasing concentrations of each one of these. So the color of the molecule here corresponds with the bars over here. So strictly speaking, sulforaphane is not an HDAC inhibitor. You can see here, here's the parent compound, increasing concentrations, no inhibitory activity. None, nor is there with the green here with this glutathione conjugate. But with sulforaphane cis, we saw very nice dose-dependent inhibition. The IC50 was about 15 micromolar. And we know when we eat broccoli, those concentrations and higher are certainly achievable in our, the cells of our colon. So this is a concentration of a food compound that's achievable in our GI tract that should be inhibiting HDAC activity. So then we asked, well, if it's doing this, in a test tube, is it doing it in animals? That's a far more complicated question. But the answer was yes. When we took sulforaphane and gave a single oral dose of this sulforaphane and then looked in the colon, six hours after taking in one dose of sulforaphane, we have very significant inhibition of HDAC activity in the colon and in other tissues. So this encouraged us to go forward and do a longer term study. This was a six hour study. This was a six month study. So we fed sulforaphane in the diet for many weeks. And you can see in this experiment that this is an animal, it's called the APC min mouse, it doesn't really matter the name. This is a mouse that spontaneously develops tumors in the GI tract. And you can see here, sulforaphane in the diet significantly inhibited, inhibited tumors. And corresponding with this, we saw inhibition of HDAC activity in the colon and other parts of the GI tract. I'm not showing all the data here. And we saw the genes that have been shut down in the animals, such as BAX and P21, were re-expressed, triggering reductions in tumors. So we've shown now, so, We've done a hypothesis, prediction from computational modeling, proof of the mechanism in a, in a test tube, and then showing that it also works in an animal model that spontaneously develops tumors in the GI tract. Okay, so this is our working hypothesis. A number of questions came up along the way, and I'll explain these questions as after I present them. So the first question was, does the parent compound, sulforaphane, induce NRF2 enzymes that generate the HDAC inhibitor metabolites? So I'll explain that in just a moment, but that was one of the questions that came up. The second question was, our NRF2 induction, as described after Talalay's work, and HDAC inhibition equally important? Does one supersede the other? Do they both, both play a role? And then the third question was, does NRF2 status, does the amount of NRF2 that you have in your cells impact in any way HDAC levels? And if so, which HDACs? 
And this is to tell you that we don't have one HDAC in our cells. We've actually looked at almost well, 10 different HDACs. So it gets very complicated looking in different tissues, different cancers. You find certain HDACs are overexpressed in colon cancer, others are overexpressed in mammary cancer, and so on. So what's the point of this first question? Why, why is that relevant? Well, I'll bring you back to this mechanism. You'll notice one of the key genes that is induced through NRF2 signaling is GST. Why is that important? Well, GST is the first enzyme that converts sulforaphane through this pathway. So you can imagine, actually, sulforaphane could be almost the perfect 1-2 chemopreventive agent. The parent compound could induce NRF2, which would be a good thing. As a consequence, GSTs would be induced, and it would drive the formation of metabolites that still have chemopreventive activity through HDAC inhibition. So now you have the parent compound doing a good thing and the metabolites doing a good thing as well. So that was one of the questions we had is how does the GSTs affect the pathway? And then the other part was which HDACs? And again, I'm not going to show you all the data. This actually, this figure is a summary of five years of research by a postdoc in the lab. So what we showed is, and this is actually was a big surprise. When you talk to people in the cancer chemo prevention field, the criticism you often hear, especially from clinicians, is, well, dietary compounds are sort of dirty bombs. They're sort of pleiotropic agents. They hit everything. How can they be specific enough for a clinical trial? So actually, we expected sulforaphane metabolites to probably target all or most of the HDACs in our cells. That turned out not to be the case. Surprisingly, one HDAC, we're referring it to as the Sentinel HDAC, was responding to sulforaphane in colon cancer cells, and it turned out to be HDAC3, not all of the other HDACs. So the point of this slide is just to tell you, I won't bore you with the details, but not all of the HDACs are targeted at all. There's one HDAC, and it's HDAC3, and as a consequence of sulforaphane treatment, actually HDAC3 protein is turned over. So one of the key questions we had is, well, again, it's one thing to show this in a Petri dish with colon cancer cells. How about in an animal model? So can we see HDAC protein, HDAC3 protein loss in an animal? And how is that impacted, if anything, by NRF2 status? So first of all, we did an experiment in a mouse, a mouse model. We gave a carcinogen, dimethylhydrazine. This is a very well-known agent that triggers colon tumor formation. And then after the carcinogen, we treated mice in the diet, either with continuous sulforaphane every day, or we gave it on alternating days, every other day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, etc. And the question was, do you need to have continuous sulforaphane, or even if you had it every other day, let's say you eat it on Monday and Friday, is it still going to be effective? So the outcome from the study was pretty conclusive. You need to eat it every day. So in this study, this is tumor multiplicity. This means the number of tumors per mouse. And you'll see here, at the end of the study, each mouse averaged about six colon tumors per animal. In the animals given <coughs> daily sulforaphane, there was a significant inhibition of tumor multiplicity, but with alternating sulforaphane, there was no protection. And in fact, when we look further at tumor burden, so this is not just numbers of tumors, but also the size of the tumors as part of the calculation. You can see very significant inhibition of tumors by daily sulforaphane, not by alternating. So this sort of fits with the epigenetic idea. We have compounds in broccoli. They're relatively weak ligands, binding agents for our HDACs. They're not going in there and sitting in there and permanently inhibiting the enzymes. So to keep them inhibited, you kind of need to eat these sorts of things all the time. So that's kind of what we were thinking here. So then we looked, of course, at the tumors from these mice. 
And we showed that indeed, with daily sulforaphane treatment, HDAC activity in the tumors, in the lysates, was again significantly inhibited with continuous sulforaphane. And we actually looked at different HDACs at their protein levels. And hopefully you'll agree with me, when you look at this one, you'll see again in three mice that were getting daily sulforaphane, HDAC3 protein was about half the overall expression level compared with the animals given control diet. So we've established, yes indeed, the HDAC that seems to be targeted in a petri dish in colon cancer cells is also targeted in tumors from an animal. And just to confirm that further, we did a bunch of other Western blots, protein analyses, and there was a highly significant inhibition of HDAC3 protein and a corresponding increase in histone acetylation. Remember from the early model, HDAC inhibition is synonymous with histone acetylation and opening the chromatin. And so that's actually shown here where using an antibody that recognizes acetylated histones. So now we come to the very interesting question of NRF2 status. How does NRF2 status impact or interact with HDAC inhibition? Are the mechanisms equally important or what's the role here? But to address this question, we went back and repeated another experiment <coughs> And this time, we have either wild-type mice or we have mice that are NRF2 deficient, right? So now we can compare wild-type versus NRF2 deficient. And now we're giving sulforaphane continuously in this study. And the first big surprise, we totally did not expect this, if you look only at the the dark gray and the light gray to begin with. You'll notice this is the NRF2 deficient mouse. This is the wild type. So this tells you if you give a carcinogen to a deficient mice that has the NRF2 deficiency, it seems to be resistant to tumor formation. So actually, that's the reverse of many other studies that are in the literature. If you take carcinogens from cooked meat or from cigarette smoke or other carcinogens and you put them into this mouse, this actually goes in the opposite direction. So we have an unusual case here. Now in those other, in those other studies, the target tissues weren't the colon. They were lung or liver or stomach. So in this particular case, this almost implies that having NRF2 in the colon could almost be oncogenic. It's kind of provocative to say it that way. But that's really what this is saying. The presence of NRF2 allows the animals to develop more and bigger colon tumors. So that led us to a number of other questions. Okay, we've shown HDAC3 seems to be the sentinel HDAC in cell culture. We've shown that it's the protein is, is lost in the previous studies. What about on the target genes that are playing a role in tumor development? Is the HDAC3 actually playing a role on the genes, not just globally? And then the other question is, which target genes should we examine? How do you, how do you go about answering that question? So to, to tell you the answer, are HDAC3 levels affected on target genes? The answer is yes, some target genes. Which genes should we examine? P16. So how did we come to that conclusion? Well, I'm going to go back and remind you of some basic biology. You remember the cell cycle, right? Everyone remembers G1, S, G2, M, right? Hopefully everyone remembers this. So at each point through this cycle, there are called checkpoint controls. It gets very complicated in a hurry, but there are proteins that are critically important for regulating each of these steps throughout the cell cycle. And if you mess around with any of those checkpoint controls, then you go to hell in a handbasket quickly. So P16 is critical for regulating G1S. If you have high P16, it basically shuts down the transition from G1 to S. How does it do that? Here, in this figure, you see external stimuli, different signals, they are regulating proteins called cyclin D1 and CDK, 
And the, the upshot of all of this is a transcription factor called E2F1 gets released, and this drives G1 into S. So if you have P21 expressed, it would prevent this transition. So, can, so the thinking is, if you have P21 in a cancer cell and it's shut down, that cancer cell can progress. So if I turn that around the other way, if you have low levels of P16 in a cancer and you can cause it to be re-expressed through the epigenetic mechanisms I talked about, that would be a good thing because it would, it would mess around with the cell cycle. So that's exactly what we found in our studies. So just to take you through that very quickly, we actually looked using RNA-seq at thousands and thousands of genes. So this table actually will go all the way down to China. It's a very long list of, of genes. But these are the top ones uh, that were really dysregulated when you look at normal versus tumor. And why am I focused? Okay, there's a lot of things going on here. These are all red in the normal. These are all green in the tumor. So I could be talking about this one. Why am I talking about this one? Well, the reason is, in all of our comparisons, P16 was at the top of the most dysregulated genes. So here, for example, if you simply look in the NRF2 wild-type mouse in the tumor versus adjacent normal colon, and this is the expression of all the genes in the array. Five-fold increased is here, five-fold decreased is here. So these two genes are overexpressed about 20-fold in colon cancers in this mouse model. Then when we look in now, here we look in the knockout mouse or in the heterozygous, again, tumors versus normal, again, P16, 10-fold higher. So we did a whole bunch of these comparisons, and in each one, other genes were up or down, and some were slightly up and some slightly down, but in all cases, P16 was like the main guy that was getting our attention. So we validated this data by a technique called qPCR, looking at mRNA expression in the tumors. And again, this is what we found. So this is kind of complicated. Here you have a wild type mouse. There are P16 expression levels readily detectable in the tumor. But when those mice are given <coughs> sulforaphane, the expression level goes up. So that's kind of what you might expect, right? It's a tumor suppressor. It's a good thing that you can increase the expression levels. But now look over here at the NRF2 deficient. Just changing from wild type to deficiency increases P16 levels in the tumor. But that wasn't expected. And moreover, in this background, now when you give sulforaphane, this doesn't go up the way you might hope. It actually goes down. So we repeated this many times with many tumors. And then we said, well, this is messenger RNA. What about the protein? That's the really important thing. Okay, messenger RNA levels can go up and down. Is it changing at the protein level? And the answer was yes. So this is immunohistochemistry. And it's using an antibody to detect P16 in tumors. So you can see here in this close-up, his normal colon, this is the adjacent tumor. If you zoom in on this, you can see P16 highly expressed in the tumor compared to normal. And in the same scenario, when you give animals sulforaphane, it's even more expressed. So actually, the RNA levels are predicting beautifully what's happening to the protein levels in the tumors. And the same was basically true down here with the, with the heterozygous mice. So for those of you who are CHIP aficionados, and I know there's some of you in the audience, CHIP stands for chromatin immunoprecipitation, and it's a way of interrogating genes and the proteins that are sitting on them in real time. So what we can do here is we can use an antibody to HDAC3, and we can ask, in this region of the P16 gene, is HDAC3 bound there or not? And that's indeed what we confirmed. So when we look in the tumors from these mice, if you just look at the gray bars, these are really quite high levels of HDAC3 
sitting on this gene. What does that tell us? It says in the tumor from these mice, HDAP3 is sitting on the P16 gene, trying to shut it down, trying to repress the expression of the gene. But as soon as you give the sulforaphane, now that comes off of the gene. So that fits beautifully with what we saw up here. So forophane, loss of HDAP3 would trigger an increase in gene expression. So, okay, I've shown you that HDAP inhibition is important in, in cell culture. I've said so forophane triggers HDAP3 protein loss selectively. I've shown you that in mice, that HDAP3 loss is happening in the tumors when animals are given sulforaphane, corresponding with tumor suppression. And I've told you that that's because HDAP3 is a key repressor of the P16 gene. So the real question is, well, if that's happening in mice and in cells in a petri dish, is it happening in humans? So is this reciprocal relationship between P16 and HDAP3 also true in humans? So to answer this question, we took healthy human volunteers, many of them were students, and they took either a placebo or a broccoli sprout extract supplement. So we could have had the volunteers eat broccoli, like a huge, humongous bowl of broccoli. Uh, we could have had them eat broccoli sprouts. So, you know, I told you that these have 50 to 200 times the level of glucoraphanin compared with this one. So that's very doable. For the kind of doses we're trying to achieve, one cup or half a cup of broccoli sprouts would have done the job. And in fact, we've already reported that that's true. But for this study, we actually went to a supplement that is now in about a dozen clinical trials around the country. So this has taken the broccoli sprout, made an extract, put it in a pill, and now you can give it one day or for a week and compare it with the placebo, which be, be another green pill but doesn't have the sulforaphane in there or the broccoli sprout in there. And what we did in this study, uh, after the very first ingestion of the supplement, we collected blood at various times. And then after seven daily ingestions of the supplement, we collected again blood at different times, 24, 48 hour, hours, two weeks, and then we prepared peripheral blood, mononuclear cells, and plasma. So if you just focus for now on the black lines, this is the sum of sulforaphane metabolites, kindly analyzed by Dr. Steve Talcott sitting over there. So what this tells us is when you eat this broccoli sprout extract, indeed, sulforaphane is getting into the body. So actually, we have all the different metabolites quantified, but this shows you about three hours after eating the, the supplement, the sulforaphane metabolites are peaking in plasma, and then they rapidly come down again. And by 24 hours, they're pretty much down to baseline. And then after seven daily ingestions, again, after the seventh ingestion, we're seeing another peak, seems to be slightly lower than here, and then it's back down to baseline, and by two weeks, there's basically no detectable sulforaphane metabolites in the plasma. So this sort of fits with the mouse model. You need to have daily intake in order to keep the, the sulforaphane metabolites high enough, presumably to inhibit HDAPs. So then we took the peripheral blood mononuclear cells and we showed, as in the mouse model, the reciprocal relationship of HDAP3 to P16. So here in the blood cells, we have detectable levels of HDAP3. Well, look what happens after you ingest that first BSE supplement. Immediately afterwards, one hour, three hours, six hours, 24 hours, HDAP3 protein levels are dramatically reduced. And even after you have it seven daily ingestions, it's staying low and then comes up again. And corresponding with this, at least at the early time, Loss of HDAP3, remember this should be sitting on the promoter of the P16 gene. So now P16 is getting induced. So, okay, we've established in a human now, when you take a broccoli extract, 
the same reciprocal relationship as in the mouse and in the petri dish. But mo not many of us are taking broccoli supplements. What about if we eat broccoli or other cruciferous vegetables in normal daily practice? So we performed a screening colonoscopy trial. We took people who are 50 and older, they're coming in at that age for a screening colonoscopy. So they don't necessarily have colon cancer, most of them won't. The ones that have a polyp, we removed the polyp. And we subdivided them into those with high cruciferous vegetable intake and those with low. This was based on a very comprehensive cruciferous vegetable food frequency questionnaire. 120 different cruciferous vegetables. Who thought cruciferous vegetables was cabbage, cauliflower, and broccoli? <laughs> so it was very comprehensive, serving size, ways that you cook the food, all of those sorts of questions were in there. And based on that, a third party, not us, a third party at Arizona Cancer Center could determine estimated intakes of cruciferous vegetables. <coughs> So they had the questionnaire, they came in for the clinic visit, we collected blood, and then we performed a colonoscopy. So during endoscopy, we collected the polyps, but also these, these subjects consented to take normal colonic tissue as well, even if they didn't have a tumor or a polyp. So we could collect colon biopsies. So the first question is, if this is happening in blood from a short-term treatment, how about in people 50 years old and who've been eating cruciferous vegetables. So this was a real excitement when we got this data. This is in the circulating blood cells. And you can see when you stratify by people who report high cruciferous vegetable intake, more than five servings a week, they have much higher levels of P16 compared with the people who have basically no cruciferous vegetable intake. So this fits beautifully with what we were seeing in the short-term study with the extracts and in the mouse models and in cell culture. So this is in circulating blood cells. How about in the target tissue? That's the real question. So we looked at the colon biopsies and these were stratified from lowest to highest cruciferous vegetable intake, left to right. So again, people, and so here's the patient colon biopsy. Again, people eating basically no cruciferous vegetable have low levels of histone acetylation. As soon as you start to get up to three and four servings a week, now you start to see very appreciable induction of histone acetylation. And this coincided, I'm not showing it, with loss of HDAC activity, even though the HDAC3 protein was somewhat variable. The other thing you'll notice is P16 is also induced with sulforaphane intake. With broccoli intake. So again, this correspond, corresponds with what we pre would predict over here and from the mouse model. So again, I'm not going to tell you all of the details, but all of the associations that we would have predicted from our mouse studies and our cell-based assays were predicted beautifully in this colonoscopy trial. One thing I wanted to point out to you, if you look here, this is NRF2 protein level. And that actually is, as you'd agree, that's incredibly variable. So independent of your cruciferous vegetable intake, we thought, well, this is interesting. In normal colon, not tumors, just normal colonic biopsies, there's a huge variability in NRF2. So why, why is that? What does that mean? We went into a database that a lot of oncologists use. It's called the Cancer Genome Atlas. Every time anywhere people do these large data analyses in cancers and normal tissues, they deposit the information, and this is accumulating more and more over time. So you can go in today and surf this information. You can come back a week later. There's a whole bunch more information that's been deposited there. So what we were able to do is to go in, for example, and look at the expression of P16 in relation to NRF2. So the first point you'll notice is in both normal colon and colon cancers, more than almost 400 colon cancers, there's a huge variability in NRF2. So in the human population, there's almost 
the analogy of what we're seeing in our mouse models. We have the wild type, the heterozygous, and the null. That's actually present in the human population. And that's associating with NRF2 expression inversely. And this, again, is basically what we predicted from our mouse models. So what's the model? It's a complicated situation, and I don't pretend to know a fraction of it, but this is our current working model. Ask me next week, and it will probably have changed. So after initiation, and by this I mean anything from carcinogen exposure, metal exposure, pollutant exposure, whatever leads to the initiation of carcinogenesis. We imagine two different scenarios. One we would call NRF2 proficient. And in the colon, this leads to a progressive tumor growth. And as the tumors get to be very large, we have HDAC overexpressed, including HDAC3. So HDAC3 is sitting on P16 and repressing it. So we imagine food compounds, and particularly sulforaphane, because that seems to selectively target HDAC3 for inhibition, it now inhibits HDAC3, allows P16 to be expressed. On the other hand, in an NRF2 deficient scenario, and there are humans, as you just saw, that have very low levels of NRF2, in the colon, we start to see tumor develop, and they sort of are held at a certain size rather than progressing. And under these circumstances, HDACs are actually low or hardly overexpressed at all. So if you have a molecule that's an HDAC inhibitor, but their target is gone, it's got nothing to target. So that's kind of the scenario we're imagining when you have very low levels of NRF2. So what are the conclusions? First of all, I didn't talk about this in detail, but I, I mentioned the, the modulators of your epigenome. A lot of those things in rye bran, garlic, broccoli, and other foods through metabolism can generate these HDAC inhibitors. And they can target genes like P21 and BAX in cancer cells, triggering apoptosis or cell growth arrest. In the case of sulforaphane and other dietary isothiocyanates, so any food that you think of that's very pungent, more often than not, you're talking about isothiocyanates. Could be radish, uh, horseradish, wasabi, daikon, those sorts of foods that are super spicy, quote unquote releasing isothiocyanates. So we think it's not the parent compound, but again, the metabolites, the cyst and the NAC, that can fit the HDAC pocket and inhibit activity. We've shown in the APC min mouse, I showed you one slide on this. In this mouse tumor model, polyps are suppressed, and that corresponds with loss of HDAC activity and induction of acetylation. I didn't show the data. This isn't only occurring in the GI tract, but also in systemic tissues like the prostate and circulating blood cells. I've shown you that NRF2 deficient mice, surprisingly, were more susceptible to tumor induction in the colon than wild type. We certainly didn't predict that. And in this scenario, you see that tumors from wild type mice have much higher levels of HDAX globally, much higher levels as well as on target genes such as P16. I've showed you that the uh, decreased anti-tumor activity of sulforaphane in the null is again related to HDAC levels on the target genes that we're looking at. And then I went on to show you in human subjects, either giving a broccoli sprout supplement or just recording people who say they eat lots of cruciferous vegetables Again, we see the same inverse relationship between P16 and HDAC3. And then I ended with this story about NRF2 being very variable. So based on the model that I just showed you, we think NRF2 status in the colon might have something to say about how effective HDAC inhibitors are in the clinic. So I mentioned to you earlier that varinostat is in clinical trials for lymphoma. There's quite a lot of variability in those trials. One thing that you find as nutritionists, we find this shocking, but maybe not shocking. A lot of oncologists never ask their patients, what's your diet and lifestyle? 
are you eating lots of cruciferous vegetables? So you're already loading up on HDAC inhibitors in the way you live your life. So now when we give you HDAC inhibitor drugs, they can be more efficient because they're working with one another. So those sorts of questions are never asked. And now we're wondering on top of that, maybe the NRF2 status in your colon also dictates whether those HDAC inhibitors are gonna work or not. So while we're talking about drugs, I wanna re-emphasize the whole food approach. If you don't like Brussels sprouts, maybe you like broccoli or broccoli sprouts. And so people in the Texas Medical Center, my colleagues at MD Anderson Cancer Center and Texas A&M Health Science Center are very excited about this idea. It's the so-called field to clinic paradigm that we're working on now. This is why I came here. The ability to take whole foods and their isolated compounds, move them all the way these sorts of trials into humans and ask, are they working in people? So I'd like to thank the current group, the current gang. Um, the person who did a lot of the work I presented today is Praveen Rajendran and Mohaiza and uh, these other guys too. Thank you. I get that question a lot. So the raw cruciferous vegetables is where you would get the maximum amount of isothiocyanates, not, not necessarily just um, sulforaphane, but all of them. So the, the analogy I give you is, um, I mentioned I've spent a lot of time in Japan, and uh, if you go to the high-class sushi restaurants, when you get wasabi, they don't give you green stuff from a tube. <laughs> They give you a wasabi root, like a horseradish root, and a little personal grater. I think it's to see if you're drunk enough to stop grating your fist. But what that does is to break open all of the cells of the wasabi root, releasing myrosinase to maximally release sulforaphane. So after 10 minutes, that wasabi is atomic level. Right? I mean, you can smell it just when it's sitting there on the side. So that's the maximum amount that you're going to get. So if you eat broccoli and you munch on it, raw broccoli in a salad or in a dip, and you munch it well, you're going to be releasing large amounts of this in your upper gut and also it getting into the lower gut. Now, if you cook broccoli or other cruciferous vegetables, that will tend to inactivate myrosinase. Now, there's a debate as to whether the gut microbiota will generate appreciable levels of so forophane from glucoraphanin in the colon. So a lot of the literature up until about two years ago says yes, that indeed happens. And there are animal studies that suggest that. Um, there are scientists from the University of Illinois, Elizabeth Jeffrey, who's put a question mark on that in humans. She's looked at different microbiota and different levels of sulforaphane from cooked broccoli, and it's not so clear. I, prefer to be optimistic and think, you know, eat your food all the ways that you can to maximize all the different ways you can get these exposures in the upper gut and lower gut. There must be more questions. Yes. That's a great question. So actually, when we got the human study funded in the very beginning, it was actually to use broccoli sprouts, or actually freeze-dried broccoli sprouts. We've done a, a small pilot study with about 10 people with fresh broccoli sprouts from the supermarket, showed that when they ate fresh broccoli sprouts, HDAC inhibition was going in the PBMCs and was recovering. So we were funded to do a much larger study with broccoli sprouts that were gonna be freeze dried. Right around the time the grant was funded, Dr. Talalay met me at a conference in England and said, Rod, we're showing huge variability even with freeze-dried broccoli sprouts in terms of sulforaphane metabolites in people. 
So he went to the BSE supplement because he said, based on some trials at Johns Hopkins, it was controlling for a lot of this variability among cultivars. So they're working off of one cultivar, they're doing all the QA, QC to validate the supplement and the placebos, and they're sending them out to a bunch of trials. So we thought, okay, that makes sense. Now, the real interesting finding is, in hindsight, we shouldn't have done that. My colleague, Dr. Emily Ho, who actually spoke here a year ago, she showed that when you simply took the broccoli sprout extract supplements and the fresh broccoli sprouts, instead of giving more bioavailability, the BSC supplement was giving less. Actually, about one third of the fresh broccoli sprouts. So you have a dilemma here. What you'd like to do in clinical trials is give the fresh broccoli sprouts because they are the ones delivering most sulforaphane. The problem is a clinical trial can go for weeks and months. And so every cultivar varies. Even the one cultivar, if you grow it in January and March and summer, the amount of glucoraphanin varies. So we still haven't optimized glucoraphanin for delivery in clinical trials. Okay, well, let's have a big hand for uh, Dr. Jasper. I'm sure we have the next class is coming in. There will not be a luncheon today. Uh, hopefully you all will love that. And thank you all for coming. Thank you very we'll much. see you next week. Well, don't forget to sign the uh, on the dark one.